At the end of 15, I was still really, really small. And so that summer is when I started to grow. As I got taller, I ran faster, jumped farther. And it was just a direct correlation. And when I talk about it now, people would never realize that um, I was a small, short kid for my age. I was a very late bloomer as an athlete, so no one would have imagined that I would have gone on to become an Olympic champion, especially at that age. years old. He was competing as a long jumper. He was very small. One day at a meet in Philadelphia, um, uh, Jesse Owens was there. Carl Lewis's father went up to Jesse Owens and said, uh, you know, Mr. Owens, I wanted to introduce you to my son, Carl. He's a long jumper. Jesse Owens uh, looked down at this little boy and said, uh, well, uh, you're competing against these kids who are so much bigger than you are. You must be a spunky little guy. About three years later, uh, Carl Lewis suddenly started to grow. So from being this little spunky little guy at the age of 12, he became a big guy at 15. The number you dialed is not a working number. Please check the number and dial again. The 100 meter final was, it was electric obviously because it's a huge event and the stadium is 93,000, it was completely full and that's what was great about Los Angeles. The morning and night sessions were completely full, all of them. There was this anticipation because everyone knows that the 100 meters would have been the most difficult of the four events. I was focused on running my best. I knew that if I ran my best race that I could win. I didn't worry about the other people. I just kept the energy down to run your best race, you win. Run your best race, you win. But I knew Sam Grady was definitely a challenger. He has a great start. He's a good athlete. Um, Ron Brown, who's also the other American, I knew he'd be a challenge. Alan Wells was coming back, but Alan, I, I wasn't really worried about him. He didn't make the final. So really those two, the two Americans were the ones that I thought that had a shot. Um, because at the time, we were just so far ahead of everyone else. And, and I just realized, look, don't worry about them. If you run your own race, you win it. So it's really going back to the basic elements, um, really specifically like push out of the blocks, run, put your feet down, stay tall. These are the things that go through my head when I run and practice so that I can clear my mind and just run them like that. In that race, he was at his, even though he kept winning after that, he was at his peak. At one point he was clocked at, uh, uh, you know, by American standards, 28 miles per hour. And so, um, you know, it, it is great. I mean, there's this great quote from Sam Grady, who, who took the silver medal. And, you know, he said the 80 meter mark, he was in first place. And he thought he was going to win the gold medal. And then out of the corner of his eye, he saw Carl Lewis just appear and then zip past him in, in front of him. Uh, Carl Lewis was, you know, he was a, a fantastic athlete. 
на Укарщину. Да. His winning margin was the, the widest in Olympic history, you know, until Usain Bolt. So that was the beginning of, of Carl Lewis and his four gold medals. The 100 meter medal meant the most, obviously because that's the first one. Um, when you dream of the Olympics, you never know what it's going to be like until you get there. And then when you go there and you win, then now you're an Olympic champion for life. So absolutely, the first one was uh, the most special one there for sure. I was the best in the world at that time. Right. But in those days, when you broke 10 seconds in the 100 meters, it was sort of a big deal. At the time, the world record, I believe, was not faster than 993, I believe, was the world record at the time. So if you wanted to extend seconds, that was a very fast time. In Los Angeles, all of the buzz was about Carl Lewis winning four gold medals, and the 100 meters was just one, actually the first, of the gold medals that he needed to win. He had some control over three of those medals. Um, he didn't have complete control over the fourth one because he was a member of a relay team. So if the relay team had made a mistake um, with two false starts or if they'd passed out of the zone or dropped the baton, that fourth gold medal was in doubt. But the other three events he had some control over, it was really not close. I mean, none of the events were close to Carl Lewis in, in those 84 Olympic Games. Those games were all about Carl Lewis. I wanted to be excellent. When I went to University of Houston, when I was 18, I had no intention of being a sprinter. I was strictly a long jumper, and that was it. The sprinting came on later as I started to have some success. I put them on a scale of one to 10, and the long jump is a 10, the 100 meters is a four. I mean, it's that different. It is so much more difficult. And that's why you don't see jumpers and sprinters, because it's very difficult to do the long jump. Um, and you'll never see a sprinter that becomes a long jumper. It just will never happen. A long jumper can become a sprinter, though because it's the easier event. It was, it was a big joy to win the Olympic Games, but the bigger emotion was relief because for a year and a half, it was just anticipation, anticipation, and then the pressure um, coming from outside, and then the way the media is saying, well, you gotta do all four or you're a failure. You know, so therefore it was a lot of relief to say, wow, I got that off my shoulder, now let's go to the next event, and that's really what it was. When I retired from competition, I was ready to go. I, I haven't um, missed it, per se, one minute. And that's, that's not a negative thing. I look at it the opposite. It's positive. I milked every ounce of energy out of my Olympic experience. And when I was on the podium in 1996 in Atlanta at 35 years old, um, it all came out of me. I realized then it's time to go because I did everything I possibly could have done times 100. <laughs> Great, thank you. Okay.